Hello, hello everyone. I am Virginia Cinquemani. I'm the author of Sustain Able, How to Find Success as a Sustainability Professional in a Rapidly Changing World. And this is appointment number four, so the, our fourth live stream uh, of the book club. So every week we've been looking at a different chapter of the book. And now uh, we are tackling selling, which is one of the most popular Green Gorilla um, masterclasses. So one of the most popular talks that I get to do. And I'm just faffing about for a couple of minutes because the live stream shouldn't be starting for another four. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I would ask for a, a favor to those people that are already connected. If you could please type something in the live chat, because last week, it actually didn't work at all. So I couldn't see any comments or anything that people uh, were saying. So if you can just say hello or we're here, thumbs up, something, that would be fantastic. Otherwise, it's really not great. Let me see. Yeah, I can see that a couple of people are, is the live chat working? I might as well open LinkedIn and practically do that. And if one of you folks are connected to me on LinkedIn, I know it's a bit rough off, but if you have a very important question and I can't seem to see the and um, you know the live chat, please type it there and I will answer it anyway live. It's just a bit weird and I'm not sure. So anyway, let's start very slowly talking about uh, um, selling. So selling sustainability in particular. And when I mean selling, when I speak about selling, I don't necessarily talk about exchanging money. This is a concept that came clear to me once I started working in sustainability many, many years ago. And when I had responsibility for the members of the BRE Academy, if some of you know me, you know that I used to work at BRE. So um, I could see how technical people were very bad <laughs> at selling. They were very bad even at explaining the concepts. So, so when I say selling, I actually mean influencing and talking to people about something and convince them about your idea. And I could see that lots of people that had a technical background actually struggled to do that. So that's how I had the idea of um, implementing this framework and especially around selling sustainability. So really, this is the core of what Green Gorilla does. So um, before I move on, uh, I want to remind everyone that we're starting a new sustainable mastermind. So let me just spend you know, a couple of minutes on this. Sustainable is the book, as you know, um, and the mastermind is structured around uh, the content of the book. So we're talking about communication, we're talking about selling, we're talking about uh, the uh, resilience, and we're talking about uh, project and people management. So the mastermind is a blend of training courses that are already there, so the e-learning courses, live webinars that we do twice a month, plus a Q&A at the end of the month. We do a monthly challenge on one of the themes that I believe are key to sustainability professionals to develop. And then we have one-to-one -one coaching with me. It's a really, really rich program. It lasts for a year. And uh, we are in the fourth month of the first group. And it's amazing. The results that we achieved with this group are incredible. On a personal level, on a group level, these guys have already formed a tribe and they are doing incredible things, like going from stay-at-home mom, trying to deal with lockdown and homework to launching a business in the space of three months and winning a grant, a grant for that. Someone who didn't know how to say no, overwhelmed by work and uh, really stuck in a position that, you know, she didn't progress in, to looking ahead, being confident, to say no, being able to manage her time brilliantly and moving on to, uh, you know, next step. 
that sort of story is so common in the mastermind and I'm super happy that these people are doing well, but you can do well as well. So I'm hosting a webinar to explain more about this on Tuesday. Uh, look on the website. You can get 10% off uh, if you're watching this now. So if you are using the code that is in the comments below, um, the, the discount code you can take you can get 10% off the mastermind so worth checking but anyway we're doing a free webinar on Tuesday 18th to go through that so anyway let's start without further ado please as someone that is live could you please type in the chat something to, so that I know the live chat works Otherwise, we're going to go with um, those of you that are my connection on LinkedIn, type the questions then. If I can see that someone is messaging me, then I will try and pick questions from there. I'm sorry, like the live chat didn't work last time. So let's see whether it works this time. But it'd be great if someone could type something there. OK, so. You might be thinking, oh, God, the selling uh, is not for me. You know, I'm technical. I hate selling. It's not something that I enjoy. I enjoy. Um, you know, but my boss actually would like me to do business development uh, or I have my own company and selling, unfortunately, is part of what I have to do. OK, fair enough. So we're here to help. So this chapter, which is actually called the Selling 101 for Technical People, talk about how actually to sell is human. So I'm trying, what I'm trying to say in this chapter is really trying to change the way you approach selling in a way that is less yucky, <laughs> more enjoyable, uh, is actually filling you with purpose. OK, and today, which is the first of two lives about selling, we're going to look at the ideal selling process. Next week, we're going to look at some techniques. But this week, we're going to look at the selling process. So let's start from the fact that to sell is human. So this is the title of a very good book that I suggest you might want to buy if you are an incidental salesperson. So someone who doesn't do it on a regular basis, but they have to do it. And it's by Daniel Pink. The, uh, the key part of the concept in the book is that actually we negotiate our way through life. So, for example, if you are a parent and you've got kids, you will know that you have to convince them on a regular basis a, to eat their greens or to do their homework. And how do you do that? You might use a number of negotiation techniques either consciously or unconsciously. Sometimes we bribe them. Sometimes we, we threaten them. Sometimes we make them reason. Sometimes uh, we just point, you know, put our authority and just say, you have to do it. So all of this are actually very established negotiation techniques, which we're going to go through in more details next week. But just to show you that actually selling is not something alien from you it's something that you do anyway yeah of course you don't get money back or you don't pay something but the process of selling or influencing others about your ideas is is what selling is and so we do it every day now Nowadays, selling is part of most jobs. So, for example, here in the UK, when you go and buy a newspaper, for example, or a magazine in a certain shop, they offer you a, a packet of chewing gum or chocolate to add the teal. That's selling on top of what I'm already buying. And this is what the guy, you know, the, the, the cashier has to do, even though that's not what probably signed up for. Now, um, Think also about the fact that, yes, you have technical knowledge. And the reason why you took this road is probably because you are a technical person and you want to use your sustainability credentials. However, you're not going to be able to talk about the details and the sustainability bit unless you haven't convinced your, the, the, your solution is valid. So one step back, unless you have a client to speak to, yeah, there is no reason for having your technical knowledge. So that part is actually fundamental, you know, to you to, to survive as a sustainability professional. And the other thing that you have to make peace with is that you are not trying to con people. You're not trying to sell them something they don't need. 
Everyone needs sustainability. Everyone needs a sustainable solution to their problems. All you're doing is supporting your clients and helping them addressing their help them address their issues with your sustainability solution. Um, the key bit, but I'm going to explain a lot more, uh, uh, you know, as the session goes ahead, is to step into your potential client shoes. Um, so you have to essentially understand deeply what their problems, what their issues and needs are, and match your ideas, your products, your sustainability solution with their needs. Simple, right? Mm. <laughs> We're going to go into that. Now, the other thing is you need to really check your language. Now, we spoke about the power of communication and simple communication last week. So if you haven't seen that live stream, go back. It's on YouTube. You can, you can watch a replay. Um, it's so important to control your jargon because we are all affected in this industry, it seems, <laughs> by this bug of um, jargon. Um, so, for example, I'll explain that in the book. I give a couple of examples of that. But one that really stayed with me was an engineer years ago when I was working at BRE who was trying to explain to us his idea of capturing heat from outdoors and bringing it in, even if outdoor you had temperatures of minus seven. So the system, which were some hybrid tiles, were able to uh, extract heat from the air and bringing it in the building. That's it. He sat us down for one and a half hours. So we wanted to kill each other and ourselves. It was horrible. It just couldn't understand. It, it, it didn't show us anything. It didn't show us a diagram. He was just talking and talking and talking. And by the end of the half, one and a half, that we were tortured that way. I promise you guys. Uh, we didn't get his idea anyway. So really, if you have to choose a way of speaking to your clients, choose to speak in a simple, plain language. Don't use jargon. Now, I'm going to very quickly check. No, no messages on LinkedIn. Okay. Okay, please type something in, uh, in the live chat to make sure I, um, you know, the live chat on LinkedIn, please feel free to type something there and I will pick it up. Okay, the ideal selling process. So, so the number one step to really sell effectively is to change the way you see yourself. One phrase that really stayed with me from the book I was mentioning a minute ago, To Sell is Human, is that the most effective salesperson is a curator of the abundant information available out there. So imagine you are at the British Library or whatever huge library you got in your town and not having a catalogue and not having a librarian helping you with anything. OK, so you're there and you need to look for a document or a book and you've got no clue on how to find it. So that's effectively what people are dealing with with the Internet these days. Yes, the information is available. Theoretically, you don't need salespeople anymore. Theoretically, you don't need anyone to show you anything anymore. However, for a client that is looking to find a solution to their problem, sustainable or not, they can get lost. You know, the information out there is so vast that it's very hard to find your way. So what you do, you actually explaining to them, you're showing them the map, you know, the roadmap. You are taking them by hand and showing them the way. Um, and that's how you need to see yourself. You're helping them sorting a problem out. Um the other thing is, how do you deliver that message? So the one thing is getting established, you know, establishing your head that you are a curator of the information for your clients. You are putting together a plan for them. You're explaining things they don't understand. But how do you deliver that message? Now, one thing is, if you are already at the stage that, you know, you, you want to close a deal or, or you want to convince them of your idea, Assertiveness is super important. 
I know lots of people in the industry, outside the industry, no matter what stage of their career they are, they're not sure about themselves. And that's a very normal thing. You might have suffered from the so-called imposter syndrome. We spoke about it in one of the previous sessions. Um, you might think you don't have enough experience. You might think you are too old. You might think you are a minority. You might think you haven't got enough qualifications. Whatever the thing that stops you, it, it is a stumbling block for you to be assertive. Why should you need to be assertive? Because, first of all, it's almost like an instinctive level. When you see someone assertive, you trust them because you, it shows that you know what you're talking about. So assertiveness comes hand in hand with confidence. And if you feel and look confident, your clients are going to have trust in you. Also shows that you and your opinions matter. So oftentimes we are crushed in meetings because, you know, people talk over us. Again, we talked about that, uh, you know, a few uh, episodes ago. Um, but if you are assertive, and that doesn't mean being aggressive. So let me make the difference. Aggressiveness is a completely different thing. That means you don't respect others and you expect others to just buy into what you're saying or you are imposing your opinion. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being proactive, being measured in the way you say things and not being aggressive. And if you manage to change the way you see yourself, that will change in turn the way others see you. And that will increase enormously the chances that you have to actually influence others and sell sustainability. Um, also, it means that you feel equal to others and others are equal to you. You treat them with respect and they treat you with respect. You demand respect from them. Uh, things that can prevent you from, from being assertive could be a bunch of excuses of some sort, like the ones I said before. I'm not old enough, young enough, prepared enough for whatever it is. Um, negativity, a lot. You know, when we had a bad experience, so we generalize and we think that we're always going to have a bad experience, for example. We justify ourselves, so we worry, we are too perfectionist and so we don't think we can actually do things in the perfect way that we think um, we have old ingrained conditioning from before so lots and lots of stuff that can actually prevent us from being assertive now how do you address that um, you can use the action uh, steps workbook that you find on the website Hopefully you have the book and you're listening now and you can refer back to that. Uh, but actually the workbook you can download for free from the website. And there is a whole chapter dedicated to limiting beliefs and how to rewrite that narrative. Um, especially when you are feeling that you're not good enough. For example, if you are not qualified enough, the way to, well, first of all, you will take sake and, and say, okay, I'm not qualified enough, perhaps. Maybe that's not true. You know, you have to basically understand what's realistic and what's not and what's real and what is a projection of your mind. Or, for example, if you say, so I'm not qualified enough because I'm too young, I'm you know, just starting in the industry. One way of rewriting and rephrasing that is that to say, well, I'm actually bringing a fresh pair of eyes to the situation. I'm, I'm bringing a new perspective. Or if you say, I'm terrible at presenting, Okay, if, if presentations in the past haven't gone well for you, what can you do in order to make future presentations better? So you might want to rehearse, you might want to prepare well, et cetera, et cetera. So there is always a way out. That's the thing. Let's come out of the fixed mindset. Let's embrace the, um, you know, the new mindset, the growth mindset. Um, another thing is confidence. So how do you build up your confidence? And that's built on accomplishments. So the more you do, the more confident you become. And for example, if you remember when you were starting to learn how to ride a bike, at the beginning you were falling, you, maybe you were crying. I know because my son is five and he's trying to learn at the moment. And you think you feel, oh, I can't do it. I will never be able to do it. And so you're not confident. Once you start, you're shaky. So your confidence is still not there, but it's better than, you know, a few days before. Once you ride confidently, then, you know, it's because you have probably tried and tried and tried. 
so many times and you've fallen and, and, and stand back again so many times that now you have built your confidence. So in life, is the same. If you don't take that chance, then you're not going to build your confidence. One way of dealing with that when you don't have enough experience, which I know a lot of my audience uh, probably fall into that category of the graduates or the younger professionals, think about how you reach this point in time with your life experience. So forget the sustainability sector. What did you do? You studied. Maybe you made sacrifices. Maybe you stayed up all night to finish a piece of work. Um, maybe you traveled far in order to reach you know, your place or study or work. Lots of sacrifices, lots of hard times, lots of heartbreak sometimes. All of this stuff is very important to build your confidence because if you manage to go through that and you're here to witness it and to tell me that you are a new person, then that means you can do this. So every experience, past, good or bad, can serve you to help you to strengthen your confidence because you're not coming here, you're not a newborn. You have done some stuff in the past. You can use that experience um, and think about the fact that you have overcome those difficulties successfully because you're here again. And so you you can now use this to uh, to give yourself a little boost and say, yeah, I can do this as well. Now, this is what is David Goggins, an ex Navy SEAL and ultra athlete, uh, Call the calls the uh, cookie jar method. It's almost like all these moments of experience in your life are all in a cookie jar, and then at the right time you pick one and to think about that and think how that will help you to overcome your future problem or the problem at hand. Very helpful, I think, visualization in that sense. Another thing is overcome your fear of failure. Um, there is a lovely phrase by the psychologist Susan Jeffers that uh, says, feel the fear and do it anyway. How scary is that? So when you are scared of something, um, just feel the fear and do it anyway. That's probably the most straightforward way of, of heading something that you're scared of. There are a couple of techniques you could use to overcome your fear of fear of failure. And again, if you're trying to sell something, you might be scared at the beginning. The first thing is, what's the worst that can happen? They might say no. Okay, great. You know, how many no's a salesperson gets every day? Loads. You know, they sell probably, you know, 10% to 20% of the cases, but then they got 90 to 80% of, of times that they get actually a no or a non-response. Okay, does that matter? Mm, probably not. Put things into perspective. Would that matter tomorrow? Would that matter in six months' time? Would that matter in 10 years' time? I would say no. Also, though, you can use another method. So if you don't want to look at the negative and so what's the worst that can happen, you can always envision things going well. That's a technique, is a, is a visualization technique that lots of sports people use, including Annie Murray, the, ten, uh, the tennis player, and Michael Phelps, who is, I think, he had the most uh, gold medal in the Olympics ever. Uh, it was, he used, a, used to be a swimmer, now I think he's retired. They use that visualization method for which they would think so hard the day before their, their race, for example, or their match, um, about the place and the feelings and the people and the sounds and the smells and everything. And they would visualize themselves winning. That is a super good way of fooling your brain to think that you are actually winning. And it will improve your performance. So you could do the same. Think about your meeting tomorrow. Uh, think, you know, the place. The, now we're all online. But, you know, think about the situation. Think about what you would say, what they would say. Think about what success looks like for you. What do you want to get out of this? And picture it in your head beforehand. If you can, if it's a physical place, then visit it. If you can beforehand, get accustomed to the place, the meeting room, you know, the audience, the, the auditorium, if you're going to present. <clears throat> and uh, it's a very, very powerful way, uh, which has scientific, scientifically been proven to actually work. 
Um, the other thing is that we need to accept to a certain extent that failure is part of, a li of life. And uh, we know that because we failed many times. I suppose I'm human, you're human. Probably you failed a number of times. We can't empathize with people and with others if we've never failed. We can't really feel you know, what they're feeling if we've never been in that situation. And we can't understand our limits or even grow if we never failed. So in a way, we need to embrace also those failure points. Another little exercise you could do to practice before you are starting a meeting and maybe you, you, got, you got nervous or a presentation, um, is one which is one of my favorites is the power posing. So, you know, that, that uh, you know, you sort of stand with your uh, feet, um, uh, with, um, shoulder width apart. You have your uh, arms, you know, I, I'm having my arms quite large on my hips, or I can even do that. And uh, obviously do it in a toilet or in a cubicle where nobody can see you because that's a bit, you know, can, can look a bit silly. But it's been demonstrated again that it, it does increase your testosterone levels. And we spoke about that when we talked about uh, um, body language, didn't we, last week. So power posing, try that position for a couple of minutes and see, you know, feel the power, feel the power before you start a meeting. The other thing is you could try visualizing yourself again in, into a room or into a meeting like a gorilla, green gorilla, remember? <laughs> And so feel the power, feel the space, you know, feel the space with your body and feel the authority in you. So you will have to a little bit fake it until you can make it. And that's all fine. You know, nobody has to see you when you do these things. A very simple, always available to you technique is a breathing uh, technique, which is called box breathing. So you inhale for four. You pause for four, you exhale for four, and then you pause again for four. And that repeated on a regular basis for a few, uh, for a few goes is going to help you. i got a comment. So the live chat works. Yay. Okay. So um, I've read a book once by Dorothy Samoff about presenting. She gave an excellent mantra view since. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. I know what I know. Love that. Okay, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad that I'm here. I know what I know. Very good, very good stuff. And again, positivity, you know, you need to be glad to see your client. I love that. Thank you for so much for that comment. Um, you have to you know, you have to love your client in a way. You have to be glad to see them. If you start with negativity, you're not gonna go, go anywhere. So another couple of techniques that are in the book is like tapping. Uh, shaking your body, uh, another type of breathing technique, which is the four, seven, eight. So we nail for four, uh, uh, hold for seven, exhale for eight. That's another one. But, you know, and again, read the book. Uh, all the techniques are explained in there to increase your confidence be before you start a meeting. Okay. Any questions, comments? Now we're going into the meaty part of the thing, which is, you know, once you have grown a little bit in confidence and in assertiveness, um, you need to look at your clients. So, so you start from yourself and, you know, try and work on yourself the best way you can. Um, but then it's all about your client and focusing on them because I always say any solution you have has to be a bespoke solution. Even though you have you know, a package of services or what you do is already established, there is always a way of speaking to your clients which speaks to them as people and it's nothing to do with your products, okay? And I hate with a passion those salespeople, they had a little speech in their mind and they just <laughs> give that every time to anyone. It doesn't matter, you know, who they're speaking to, what level they are, what type of people they are. Wrong, wrong, wrong. So the key to have a successful sales process is to understand exactly who you got in front of you. How do you start? You start by doing your research. So that starts before you meet people. Look at their websites and look at the social media. Look at their reports if they have any sustainability reports on the website. And there are certain researches you could do on the company. So 
you can uh, work out whether you know what business stage of development they are because every company depending on when they started and what level they are what, what stage they have reached in their business they will have different needs to be fulfilled for example a new company might need new clients a new company might need cash flow um, well, all companies need to need cash flow, but the more you go up with companies that are already mature and they not already have the customer base, the more they look at higher scope like thought leadership and uh, corporate social responsibility, etc. So you need to really get what you know the, the company you're speaking to needs at that point in time, and then you can tailor your solution and sort of dress it to, to address that particular problem. We're lucky guys in this in this field in sustainability because sustainability is an amazing solution for so many issues and problems. So I think we're lucky because we have plenty of benefits that we can speak about to plenty of solutions that we can sell our clients. The second point is uh, try and understand whether the company, beside you know their maturity, uh, sorry, their stage, they have a where they are in their sustainability journey. Now there is a little graphic that I put together myself in this in the book. I'm going to try and show it. Unfortunately, YouTube won't let me share my screen, but hopefully you can see that. And if you read the book, you will know. So this is a little, you know, um, illustration that shows the maturity level of the companies from deniers up to champions. So a company that is not engaged with sustainability yet or even doesn't want anything to do with it is a denier. Maybe there are the compliers after that. So those that actually do sustainability because they have to do it. Uh, those that do it because it's a risk mitigation technique. Okay, fine. Up to the champion level. So people that actually champion sustainability actively. And it's helpful to understand where they are because you can always try and help them to go to the next level. So if they are deniers, maybe you can push them to compliers by using the argument that you know the law actually you know, imposes it, or we are going towards net zero carbon, guys. If you want to stay behind, you know, just comply with what you know the government say, that sort of thing. Or if they are already seeing the opportunity, why don't you become a champion? Why don't you go for B Corp certification? You have to push a sustainability looking at your client's company and how they are positioned at the moment and trying to sell them the next level up. Does that make sense? Hopefully so. Um, the other thing is very interesting, and hopefully you can gather that from their social media, their uh, websites, etc. is what sustainability drivers do they have? Why should they do it? Um, if they don't have any drivers, you can find the drivers so you can, for them. And that's another thing you could do for them. Um, why should they adopt your solutions? And that's usually down to five things. The clients expect it. So the market is growing very fast, very fond of sustainability. You can see with the supermarkets and how plastic has been, you know, is outrageously <laughs> been, um, you know, target of all the social media campaigns and everything. So before COVID, uh, supermarkets were in a race to eliminate plastic from everywhere. So that's client expectations. It could be reputation. So Others are doing it. If you don't do it, if you don't adapt it to a sustainable outlook in your company, then you're going to be left behind. Then, you know, your clients are not going to um, consider you a reputable company and nobody wants that. The other one is business changes. So some businesses have to embrace sustainability because it's part of their evolution as a company. Like I was saying, maybe they are at a stage in which they understand that they're going to have more benefits by embracing sustainability than, than by not embracing sustainability. Another driver is legal compliance. They have to do it in most cases now for many, many things. The, in the construction industry, which is an industry I come from, um, there are lots of uh, local authorities, for example, in the UK, they impose um, a certification like a BRIAM or LEED or, or WELL or stuff like that. So they have to do it because otherwise they're not going to get their contracts paid, etc. So that's a very strong, usually very strong driver, but it's not the only one. 
So I know that lots of colleagues of mine use that as a main driver, but actually there are many other things they can do uh, to encourage their um, customers to take up sustainability. And finally, risk management, that's another strong one. Now, sustainability imposes a lot of due diligence, lots of feasibility studies and checks and tests and, um, and all of that stuff helps. Or, for example, specifying products that are sustainable, sustainable and certified or ethical, etc. All of this de-risk a project. So do not underestimate the value of sustainability as a risk management tool. And most companies would not want to risk and would want to embrace it just because of that. It's a super strong driver. We're going to talk about the business case for sustainability a lot more next week. I don't know why. I think I got a bit of allergy. Sorry about this. <laughs> Touching my nose all the time. Sorry about that. Um, Barriers. So obviously, <laughs> otherwise we wouldn't be here. There will be barriers to new selling sustainability to a company. And um, the number one barrier, guess what, is usually money and the financial aspect of it. But again, next week we're going to talk about how to debust the certain myths around sustainability and the cost of it. Uh, mostly, I would say, is a matter of uh, business culture and mentality. You know, simply they don't know about it enough. They haven't done it be before, so they are not going to embrace it automatically. So that's a hard one because you have to change their mentality, but again, you can influence them. Um, and again, there are lots of techniques we're going to talk about uh, this week and next week. Lack of support. Sometimes, you know, a, a relatively small cluster of people want sustainability in a company, but the majority doesn't or the management doesn't support it. They haven't got buy-in from uh, the employees. So there are issues of, the, of that kind. And then the last one, which is probably, again, one of the bigger ones is resistance to change. Change is hard. Um, there is a whole masterclass program around uh, change management and how to deal with change in, uh, in sustainability. Uh, so I would refer back to that. But resistance to change is, is huge. This is part of being humans and uh, being conservative because we want to protect our, our own you know, livelihood. So resistance to change is a big one. So let's look at then, so these are all the potential barriers you might find. And again, we're going to talk about the business case for sustainability next week. But the next step you should have in your, you know, list of things to do before you meet someone is, or actually while you meet someone in this case, is to build a personal report. So a relationship is always between one person to another person, and that's also in business. Yes, you might come from a company and trying to make a deal with another company, but actually it's always person to person. And I think I mentioned that before in these, in these live streams, but um, sales are always made for the vast majority on the basis of emotional uh, you know, on emotion, not on reason. Then we use reason to justify the sale or the, the you know, buying something, but is an emotional thing. So again, we are talking about person to person. So what do you do when you meet someone new and you want to start establish that report? First of all, you should have as an objective to, to establish a report with your client from person to person. First of all, you research like you did with a company, you do the same with the person you're going to meet. Try and see on their social media, maybe don't be too intrusive, but try and see on LinkedIn what they stand for, you know, what they stand for, uh, what sort of thing they publish and the post, um, but also their previous experience in life. And maybe you have something in common. An icebreaker is always stronger if it's a personal one. So, for example, instead of saying, look at the weather today, isn't this hot type of thing? It's always best to say, oh, I noticed you actually went to my same university. Do you remember that lecture? Oh, my God. So that sort of personal type of icebreaker is so much more powerful to establish a rapport quickly than talking about the weather. Smile. Uh, if you smile genuinely, which means with your eyes as well as your mouth, and I know this is, sounds you know, quite obvious, but lots of people do this, and that means it's a bit fake, 
um, if you smile with your, your face, you show another person that they can trust you because you've been open. Lots of studies um, about whether you should smile or not. Um, I would say, you know, smile at the beginning, show that you're a warm person, but don't fall into the, we talked about body language last week about this, didn't we? Um, don't fall into the trap of smiling all the time, otherwise you actually lose a little bit of your power. Handshake when we can, <laughs> maybe not now, but when we can one day. It needs to be strong and you need to show your full presence and your strength. And that actually is a strong sign that you're there to do business. Okay. Questions, comments. Right. Um, understand your client's personality. Now, this is my favorite bit by far. This is like my thing. <laughs> Also, because I created this system, uh, combining a number of different uh, ideas and theories, and I've adapted it to selling sustainability. So pay attention. I think this is my, you know, a unique thing to bring real life. So what type of person you're dealing with? Super important. It, it pays tenfold to understand immediately the type of personality you, you have in front of you. Now, this method that I'm going to share with you uh, splits people in four parts. Now, it is it would be silly for me to assume that the whole world is split into four. Obviously not. However, we all have predominant traits that you know that we can show that we show to others, and so we can use that to quickly establish the sort of uh, personality you got in front of you and the language that you have to use with them. So let's go into this. We, so actually, let me show you. So this is the, this that we're going to use is the DISC method. And in your company, you might have been asked to do that uh, DISC method. Can you see that? So you have four quadrants. Dominant, influential, compliant, and steady. Now, the book is in black and white, so you can't really see colors, but dominant is red, influential is yellow, compliant is blue, and steady is green. And that is when you are a combination of active or extrovert personality versus a, um, a task-focused personality, or whether you have an active and extrovert personality versus people, focused, uh, or you are reflective and introvert versus people focused um, or task focused and reflective. So this, so once you understand more or less the sort the person you got in front of you, so for example, someone who is speaking very directly and uh, they, they're going fast and they haven't got time to, to lose and um, even their gestures are quite direct and strong and, you know, they're in and out in five seconds and they don't want to heal the fluffy bits and the weather talking and everything, they're probably a red or dominant personality. If you find someone that is more, uh, yes, they are open and they can, you know, and they and they tell you what they think, so they're quite direct as well. But they're more people focused, so they are they um, they they might be more um, inspirational, they might be uh, more impulsive, they are more, you know, they try and be uh, interesting and maybe a little bit uh, more um, uh, eccentric. That sort of personality uh, is a yellow personality. Uh, or influential. So these are people that thrive with people, for example, uh, PR, you know, sort of PR roles, uh, uh, you know, lots of people fall into that little quarter. In the red dominant, I forget to say, lots of uh, people in power, like the C-suite people, like CEOs, CFOs, etc., usually fall into the dominant quarter. Um, they are leaders, you know, they are in charge. Um, then you have people who are steady, so they are focused on people and they are actually more introvert or reflective. And they are, you know, the people that really care and the people that really pay attention to you and listen to you. And uh, they take a personal interest in you and they want you to take a personal interest in them. And uh, they are more slow and, you know, they are more probably uh, aware and, and they care about the environment, you know, at large, etc. So these sort of people are the steady people or in the green quadrant. Finally, you've got people who are 
perhaps more technical, more focused on the tasks. Uh, they like their data. They are more cautious. They are um, more conscientious. Um, and these are the compliant people in the blue quarter. Now, why is it important to understand the, you know, what personalities people have? Because then you can speak to them in different ways. So if you are talking to a dominant person, you will not send lengthy emails. Perhaps you pick up the phone and talk to them or see them face to face and go straight to the issue and give them very concrete facts. Um, they prefer probably to look at return on investment. They don't want to spend time and they're not interested in the ethical arguments. So you're going to uh, talk about money with them or, uh, or exposure or any sort of return for them would be important, any sort of profit important. Um, when you speak to an influential person, so the yellow kind, then you can be a bit more inspirational. You can use storytelling. You can tell them how others have done it because they don't want to be less than others. And they always compare themselves to others as well. Um, so you maybe you can suggest about you know running for a prize and award and stuff like that and the value sustainability as a as a marketing tool that's very important for those sort of people when you're talking to people they are in the steady quadrant so people focus and reflective and introverts then take a personal interest in them but don't force them into immediate action because on the opposite they want to reflect uh, acknowledge their value. So here you can really talk about the value sustainability, the positive benefits for people and the planet, but also risk management because these people tend to be quite cautious as well. For the blue or compliant people uh, who are more task focused and reflective, then talk about the concrete facts, have your data, have your numbers. And maybe these are your technical people. These are the people that, um, you know, crunch the numbers and the, mod you know, maybe the model, the energy of, you know, your product, your building, etc. cetera. Um, and so you need to have your data and they're not going to be interested in the fluffy argumentation either. Now, I put together a nice little page where you got all these personalities. Obviously, it's too small to see there. But you can see this on page 139 of the book, where you got the personalities, the communication style, the winning sustainability benefits, what to do and what to avoid. So that's a very good table to have at hand, I would say. Obviously, the role, as I was mentioning, the role that they have beside their personality is key to what you're going to sell to them. You know, they're not going to be interested, for example, as well, if they are, um, if the company is a developer, so if you're talking to a developer, someone who builds buildings to sell them or just builds a building and, you know, they want a profit immediately, they're not going to be interested in the operational savings of the building long term. Because that's nothing to do with them. They want to see the return on investment immediately. So you can talk about how you can sell at a higher rate, how you can, if they're like interested in tenants, and then how you can fill the spaces quickly, that sort of thing. So depending really on who you got in front of you, it's not just the personality, it's also their company, their position in the company. And the final point on this is think about your own personality. How do you come across? If you are a green, for example, so if you are a conscientious person, someone that really has high values and maybe you are not you know, that direct or you're a bit cautious, etc., and you talk to a red, you need to adapt a little bit to their personality. You need to try and really focus on them and deliver to them what they want to hear from you. So that's the thing. It's important also to understand what personalities do you have in order to communicate with others? Because if you go from the green point of view, you're not going to sell them anything unless you find another green. So that's, you know, you don't have to change your personality, but definitely flexing or molding a little bit your style on the other person is really advantageous. Now, you can take the DISC personality test on the internet quite easily for free. So I, you know, go and do that. It's quite fun. Okay. So other, another important thing to do, once you understand who you got in front of you, 
it's important to ask the right questions. Last week, we spoke about listening, and that's connected to that. Listening is super important. But before you listen, you have to be able to ask the right questions. Also, keep in mind all the time that your client's wants and your client's needs are two different things. They might not have wants and needs that match. (laughs) And so it's also your job to understand what, what they actually need. For example, they might want um, solar panels on a roof. Great. Do they need solar panels on a roof? Uh, Is that going to help them become more sustainable, having a more sustainable building, for example, if we're talking about buildings? Probably not, depending on where they are, depending on, uh, you know, the technologies that are, um, you know, available to them, etc. So it's always important to ask why. For everything in general, it's always important to ask open questions. So who, why, how, etc. But especially why? Because you're going to go to the bottom of their wants and their needs. An example I have in the book is about a child. So if you have a little child, you might relate to that. And at the seaside, especially if you're in Britain, (laughs) and at the seaside, they see the seagulls and... uh, and you know, and there are you know, there's a fish and chip shop, and they want chips. Sorry, I gave away the end of the <laughs> of the <that> story. <laughs> anyway, so they want chips, and then you think like, I'm not going to give you chip, you know, you chips. You like three. <laughs> I'm not going to give you a huge bag of chips and just to eat by yourself. And they insist, and they cry, and they have a tantrum. And then, if you ask them why do you want chips, um, maybe they will tell you that they want to give them to the birdies because they saw the seagulls eating chips just a minute before. So why is always important to uncover the uh, the secret um, reasons why people want to do stuff and maybe correct their action at that point. So that's called the Toyota method. So it's asking why at least five times. Well, that's what they say, but I would suggest do it three times. So five times is probably a bit overkilling um, to get to the bottom of something. Um, the So why is also important? Because especially with sustainability, there are lots and lots of misconceptions. Um misconceptions about the value of sustainability, misconceptions about the costs of sustainability, or even of what sustainability is. Most people don't really know what sustainability is. There is a lot of talking about plastic pollution, absolutely important, key issue, But right now, we should be talking about energy and climate and how to reduce CO2 emissions as fast as possible. We should really be talking about saving the bees and biodiversity, because these are the things that are going to kill us first and not the plastic. So it's important to dispel any myths. And that's why it's important to ask the question, so to understand whether your client actually understands what you're talking about. So the first thing is also to sell for them, lots of first things. So the next thing is, in order to sell to your client, connect to your client's purpose. Start with why. That's, again, another title of a book by Simon Sinek. If you don't know that, please go and Google it. Start with why. So important. Start with what is their vision and their objective. So why what do they need to do? What is their main issue? What, are the, what is the thing that keeps them at night, uh, awake at night? Connect to that. Try and understand what their major need is. Is it marketing because they haven't got enough clients? Is it uh, cash because they don't get enough return on investment? Is it a reputation because maybe they haven't built their reputation yet or, you know, they've been tainted by something bad that happened in the past. So try and understand what their main issue is and then explain how you're going to deliver that vision, how you're going to address that problem step by step. It's important to, to, for your client to, to trust you in helping them to address their problem. So step-by-step is always important to show them how you're going to take them to that point. Finally, only finally, explain the features of that solution. So at the end, you can talk about, you know, the whole, you know, the the, the, the policies they're going to put in place, the technologies they're going to implement, et cetera, et cetera. But 
if you're talking to the CEO, you don't need to do that. You don't need, unless they ask you because they are high level. So again, don't vomit all your technical knowledge to the first person you meet. It's important to understand what to talk about to, to who you got in front of you. So nearly finished, I think. We've got a couple of more points there. Um, it's also important if they are against sustainability, as I call it the S word, it's very important to make sure that um, you use another word. <laughs> Simple as that. Because sustainability could mean responsible business. It could mean resilience. It could mean risk management. So future proofing, all of that is also sustainability. So if they are alien to the sustainability or they think is like a fluffy, nice to have a tree hugger thing, just use another word. It doesn't matter. You know, the, the result is going to be the one you want. Another good thing to do is to get them to know the project and the context. So hopefully by now you have influence your client by now you have had a chance to you know maybe they said yeah okay uh, maybe you can present me your solution now before giving them your solution try and analyze the project you're going to work on the context so it's very important to if you can to analyze the documentation they might give you and really understand the context that the project is going to be in for example so we use the PESO, which is a project management acronym for political, economic, social, technological, legal, environmental, and ethical. So analyze all of these elements around the project. So the political context, the economic context, how they're going to pay for it. Social, who's going to be involved in the community and the team. Uh, what technologies are they going to be, um, what implication by, you know, in terms of technologies they're going to be. Legal, uh, do they have to comply with some specific legislation or, or, or act or whatever? And also, what is the environmental and ethical context and how can you enhance those? So it's very important to do even the simple SWOT analysis as well. So uh, the strength, weaknesses, opportunities and threat analysis to understand the project. And only then you provide a tailored solution. Always take your time. Take your time to provide the right solution for the right client specific to the project. I can't stress that enough. Last couple of points. So I said already sell to their pain point. So what is their main worry? Connect to their why. Why would they want to engage with you? And what is the problem that they have to solve? You are there to help. So don't be defensive if, again, they don't believe in sustainability, they become a bit, you know, skeptical. You can use other words, you can talk to their issue, and you can address their issue very specifically with sustainability. So don't be put off by that. And finally, put everything in writing, because sustainability, we've seen many, many times, is the first thing to go out of the window if things get tough. So put it in writing, have a formal commitment at the end of any decision, meetings, etc. And if you can, put sustainability in a contract. So if you have the opportunity to write a sustainability brief, put it in a contract so that it doesn't go out of the window at the first opportunity. And that's how you do it. So um, let me just recap. So you start from you and changing your mindset around selling. You do your research on the company. You build a personal rapport with your clients. You understand your client personality and position. You ask the right questions. You get to know the project and the context as much as you can. Then understand exactly what their pain point is and how you can sell to that point or worry, sorry, with their pain or worry or issue they have. And then at the end, they put everything in writing so you have more chances of it being done. Ta -da. Any questions, any comments? I hope it was useful. It's a bit of a, <laughs> there is a lot in there, but it's a process. And the more you do it, the more you become accustomed to do it in the right way. And, um, and then it will get, become quite automatic, especially the understanding the personality thing. Uh, you find yourself really start analyzing your friends and your family and uh, really 
try and picture in your head what sort of personality they have. In fact, that's a little exercise you could do at any point in time to exercise that ability to really understand who you go in front of you and then speak in the language. An example of that is, for example, when you have children, you won't speak to children in the same way you speak to adults. So in that way, you are adapting your personality, you are adapting your language to the one of a child. And it's the same with a client. If they're red or dominant, then you adapt your personality and your, your, your language to them. If they are yellow, then you do the same, etc. And so you, yeah, that's it. And next week, we're going to talk about the benefits and uh, really the business case for sustainability and what you can tell to these different personalities. What are the benefits of sustainability at large and how you can actually put them, uh, you know, you can give different benefits to different people. We also are going to look at uh, storytelling as a very important technique for selling anything to anyone. Um, I love storytelling. It's probably one of my favorite subjects. Um, so we're going to talk about these two things next week. So don't miss the opportunity uh, to join me next week again on Friday. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them or any comments. I'm going to be here for another three minutes if there are some questions. Um, I hope it was useful anyway. I hope it was, you know, you're going to take away something from this. In the book, as I said, you know, it's all laid down quite nicely. So you can, uh, um, you can use it as a roadmap to selling sustainability ethically. Okay, guys. If there is nothing, I am going to say goodbye because I know that the chat is working now. <laughs> so I'm going to say goodbye. But thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for joining live. Don't forget about the mastermind. Uh, join if you think it can be useful for you. It's been so useful for the masterminders that I got on board at the moment. There are some testimonials on YouTube as well if you want to look at that, uh, if you're not convinced about my words. And uh, yeah, there is a live webinar on Tuesday the 18th uh, that you can join. Uh, look at the website for the link and, uh, and use your YouTube 10% discount if you want to join. We're starting with a new mastermind on the 8th of September. So uh, start the new school year with a, you know, with a bit of a punch, it'd be great. Okay, Doc, thank you so much, guys. I hope you enjoyed it and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, bye.